Um, so thank you so much, Matt, for um, inviting me here, um, or for rather consenting. You know, <laughs> when I when I said, "Hey, I'm coming to LA. Can I stop in Arizona?" Um, thank you for making room for me here, uh, and thank you everybody for coming out. Um, so there, there's. This is, the, this is actually the first event. The book came out in August. And so it came out when school was in session. So this is my first opportunity to actually speak to an audience of creative writing uh, students and faculty, um, which, is, you know, which is really exciting to me because in some ways like that, you know, this is um, part of who the book is addressed to. Um, and it's also addressed to myself as a former uh, creative writing student. So I'm going to read a little bit from the, from the part of the book that is um, about most directly about craft um, and about, it's, it's really about sort of an instance of craft and an instance of editing that had a huge effect on American fiction. Um, and uh, I'll just, this is, this is from an essay called Beautiful Shame or what we talk about when we talk about white writing. And uh, <coughs> I'm just going to, the essay is way, way, way too long to read the whole thing. So I'm just going to read uh, a little bit of the first part that lays out sort of the first part of the argument. And then I hope we can just talk from, from there. So uh, beautiful shame or what we talk about when we talk about white writing. Here is the voice of a man telling a story. The man is a doctor, and the story is about one of his patients, an elderly rancher who, along with his wife, has barely survived a terrible car accident. Their names are Henry and Anna Gates. Because of their injuries, they have to recover in separate rooms, and Henry becomes severely depressed, while no, even while knowing Anna is nearby and on the mend. When the doctor, Herb, visits him, Henry insists on telling him about his ranch outside Bend, Oregon, where he's lived with Anna since their marriage in 1927. So this is a quote from the story. We had a Victrola and some records, doctor. We'd play the Victrola every night and listen to the records and dance there in the living room. We'd do that every night. Sometimes it'd be snowing outside and the temperature down below zero. The temperature really drops on you there in January or February. But we'd listen to the records and dance in our stocking feet in the living room until we'd gone through all the records. And then I'd build up the fire and turn out the lights all but one, and we'd go to bed. Sometimes it'd be snowing, and it would be so still outside you could hear the snow falling. It's true, Doc, he said. You can do that. Sometimes you can hear the snow falling. If you're quiet and your mind is clear and you're at peace with yourself and all things, you can lay in the dark and hear it snow. Viewed within a piece of contemporary fiction, the feeling of this passage is one of density or richness, a density of detail and lived experience, and maybe a little too much sententiousness. Henry Gates here feels a little too wise and folksy for his own good. On the other hand, who would object to the haunting image of hearing the snow falling the inner and outer quietness required for that kind of listening. For Herb, the doctor, in the context of a conversation about modern love, it's a moment of historical awe, of embeddedness in the passage of time in the American West, specifically the history of white settlement in the high deserts of Oregon, which required enormous effort because the land itself was unyielding in resource, ter resource terms, and isolation because very few settlers wanted to stay there. The richness of Gates's language carries what might be called a spatio-temporal awareness of this moment, the sheer loneliness and strangeness, the perversity and beauty of that way of life, which few descendants of settlers, like me, remember or want to. In this case, it's clear exactly who would object to this passage in all its dimensions. The story quoted here is Raymond Carver's Beginners, which is better known as the first draft of what we talk about when we talk about love. In what we talk about when we talk about love, intensely compressed by Carver's editor, friend, and mentor, Gordon Lish, Henry and Anna no longer have names, and their recovery is described by the doctor, now named Mel, in a single offhand paragraph. Quote, I'd get up to his mouth hole, you know, and he'd say no. It wasn't the accident exactly, but it was because he couldn't see her through his eye holes. He said that was what was making him feel so bad. Can you imagine? I'm telling you, this man's heart was breaking because he couldn't turn his goddamn head and see his goddamn wife. What exactly is lost in this gesture of editing? Obviously, the density and richness of Henry Gates's speech and the governing metaphor of the audibly falling snow. 
The story has lost the ability to pass out of Herb's world and into the world of the remote Oregon Plains of 1927. Gordon Lish's version, on the other hand, is much more sonically and structurally interesting. There's the weird repetition of holes, making the injured man seem more material and less human. And then in the next sentence, the odd repetitive construction, that was what was. And then turn his goddamn head and see his goddamn wife. The rest of the text of the story features relatively short and terse paragraphs like this one. Lish's edit removes what was a tonal and linguistic detour and consolidates er, Herb Mel's account into the overall narrative rhythm. The effect of this kind of composition appears even more clearly in Raymond Carver's story, Viewfinder, which is also from the same book, What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. This story begins, a man without hands came to the door to sell me a photograph of my house. How did you lose your hands, I asked, after he'd said what he wanted. That's another story, he said. You want this picture of the house or not? Come in, I said. I just made coffee. I just made some jello, too, but I didn't tell him that. It's a story phrased almost like a joke without a punchline, a story made of non sequiturs, inhabited by characters who seem, like Beckett's characters, to have had little experience making casual conversation. When I reread Viewfinder, a story I first read 25 years ago, when I reread Viewfinder, I still feel a sense of giddy satisfaction, almost glee, at the gnomic declarative bravado of these sentences. There's a deeply American sense of strangeness tinged with a faint malice toward the audience, a new artistic invention announcing itself with no supplementary explanation. It's the same spirit you hear in Ornette Coleman's early albums or Frank Zappa or Captain Beefheart. I tend to think of the 90s noise rock band Jesus Lizard, whose singer David Yao intoned lines like, he's a nice guy, I like him just fine, but he's a mouth breather. There's a quality in Raymond Carver's early work that is a very American version of the uncanny, which Freud, using the German equivalent unheimlich, un unhomely, describes as something both deeply familiar and troublingly estranged from the familiar, haunting because it is, uh, it is recognizable, but somehow altered or doubled. Uncanny things have a strange, sometimes hypnotic power over the reader, which she may be at a loss to explain. This quality is often called Carveresque, but the historical record demonstrates that it's actually largely Lish. There's an agonized letter Carver wrote to Lish on July 8, 1980, begging him to stop production of the edited version of what we talk about when we talk about love. Even though they may be closer to works of art than the original, and people, people be reading them 50 years from now, they're still apt to cause my demise, Carver wrote. I feel like I've stepped too far out of bounds, crossed that line. He requested, um, among other things, among other changes, that Henry and Anna Gates be added back into the story, what we talk about when we talk about love. None of this actually happened. The book was published as is, and it became an enormous success further cementing Carver's reputation as a master of the short story, an American Chekhov. At the same time, it was the beginning of the end of their relationship. Not long after this episode, Carver began to refuse Lish's edits and eventually cut ties with him altogether. The Carver-Lish dispute is almost always described as a stylistic editorial disagreement. Which version, which choice is better or worse? Which edits serve the story? Lingering over this kind of questioning is the question of efficacy and worldly success. Were Lish's changes the magic formula that made Carver Carver? Lish himself thinks so. In a recent interview, he said, I think the heroizing of Carver is nuts, as is the defense. You take any cherished object and show no, no, that was made by Morty Shmulevich on a lunch break as a full-time jeweler. It's unacceptable to the fans. No one can quite process it, conceive of the case. Typically, the narrative goes something like this. Carver's earlier drafts were baggy, overwritten, conventional, maudlin, sentimental, and Lish bravely cut them, killing Carver's darlings, making them tight, economical, haunting, telegraphic. This language, more or less the language of the fiction writing workshop of the lit biz, is itself highly coded and telegraphic. It implies values rarely, if ever, directly stated. Even Carver himself, in his desperate letters, seems reluctant to say what he means, using vague euphemisms instead, stepped out of bounds, crossed over the line. When a work of art seems deliberately self-obscuring and opaque, it's always worth asking, what is being hidden and why? When a process of art seems consumed with obscuration and secrecy, again, why? 
In the workshops and in the books I read obsessively as a young writer, editing was often described in such violent and intimate terms that it became clear to me, though I would never have said so at the time, that the excised material, the fat, was metaphorically part of my body, my selfhood, which meant the story was my whole body. This essay needs to be put on a diet, one of my very first writing teachers said to the class when I was 13. I've struggled with my weight since high school, so I'm particularly attuned to this correlation. You cut away the parts of the story body you're most ashamed of, the parts you want no one to see. Which leads to another question. What was it about the specificity of Raymond Carver's version of what we talk about when we talk about love that hurt so much when Lish cut it away? So much that it threatened Carver's sobriety, his carefully reconstructed life, his ability to ever write again. Think of Henry Gates as being part of Carver's body, as one body substituted for or superimposed over another. Bring in the silence and the almost imperceptible sound of snow falling, which is also the knowledge that the nearest neighbor is 20 miles away over dirt roads, and the government-sanctioned poverty that can easily be misread as self-reliance, and you have a specific instance of whiteness made visible, painfully, embarrassingly, even sentimentally visible or cut it away, drench it in feedback, lose the name in the story, turn the sufferer into an object with holes for mouth and eyes. More than one kind of violence is at work here. I don't want to communicate, Gordon Lish said, speaking of his faith in sentences, in a 2015 interview with a scholar, David Winters. I want communion, he said. I want mutuality. I want to enter the being of the other. I want unimprovable illumination. Although Gordon Lish has never stayed long in a single institution and has never taught in an MFA program, he has probably had more influence than any other single teacher of fiction in the past 50 years, thanks to a series of remarkable seminars he's conducted in exactly the same way by all accounts since the 1970s. These seminars are founded on a technique called consecution, which is summed up by his longtime student Gary Lutz a recursive procedure by which one word pursues itself into its successor by discharging something from deep within itself into what follows. Or even more pithily by another former student, Christine Scott. Each sentence is extruded from the previous sentence. Look behind when you are writing, not ahead. The sentence that follows is always in response to the sentence that came before. The faith Lish professes, and it's clearly a faith, has to do with an imminent quality of words and sentences, a kind of radical non-instrumentalism, which insists on treating words not as dependent on what they refer to, but as entirely self-sufficient and beautiful in themselves. A good sentence for Lish is one that actually carries with it the being of the other. Its meaning, literal or figurative, is beside the point. What the hell is wrong with solipsism, he says to Winters. What I want when I'm in the presence of a writer is that person's soul. The more solipsistic, the better. A story, he's quoted as saying, must be what it is about and continue to be about what it is about. To me, the most interesting way to see Gordon Lish is not necessarily the way he sees himself as an otherworldly mystic or as a defender of a lost humanism overwhelmed by science but instead as a highly social thinker whose practice of literary aphasia is also a kind of social aphasia, the deliberate exclusion of a certain kind of reference, observation, or sign. Virtually every writer associated with Lish's teaching and editorial style is white, from writers whose heyday was in the 1980s, like Carver and Amy Hempel and Barry Hanna, to writers still much, very much active and influential today, like Christine Scott, Diane Williams, Noy Holland, Sam Lipsight, Deb Olin Unferth, Ben Marcus. The writers that Lish promoted so forcefully at the beginning of their careers, Don DeLillo, Cormac McCarthy, Harold Brodkey, T.C. Boyle, are all white. While the past four decades have seen the emergence of multicultural literature, that ambivalent phrase full of coded resentment, as a significant even dominant element of the American literary scene, Lish has operated in a parallel aesthetic universe that deals neither in culture nor multiplicity. You could call this a practice of conscious exclusion, but not in the way that it would sound, not in the way that it may sound. Whether Lish deliberately avoided working with non-white writers is a significant question for his biographers. What concerns me, because I was taught it and absorbed it, 
long before I'd heard his name, is how is his, his aesthetic so easily translates into a radical practice of shame rooted in the white body that makes it so difficult for white writers to recognize race at all. Okay, I'll stop there. So, uh, questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. So, I'm a non creative writer. Uh, I teach multi ethnic lit and I teach critical um, ethnic Yeah. But I wanted to talk a little bit about shame. Uh, because other. Talk about what, sorry? Shame. Uh huh. Because, uh, like, Tanzenka and other writers on whiteness have talked about white shame. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit more about it since that's how you went? Yeah, so um, what I'm talking about here is a particular kind of shame that is uh, rooted in the workshop that has to do with the relationship between um, the relationship between the, essentially the material that you are supposed to leave out and the material that you're supposed to leave in. So in the case of somebody like Gordon Lish, essentially the, the, um, the practice of writing that he's taught ever since the 1970s has to do with um, excising anything that uh, culturally or historically or socially locates the individual. Um, so the turn is away from uh, thinking about a person's social reality at all to a kind of aphasic um, representation of thoughts or actions as happening in this kind of very empty space, and so that's a you know that's a um, that's a that's an aesthetic of shame, and you know what's what's really interesting to me about it is that it's so um, it's so portable, in a sense. Like once you start, um, once you start, and this is you know this is the way I experience it as somebody who I never studied with Lish um, myself, but I was. Uh, it became clear to me, you know, after I had taken multiple creative writing workshops, that this idea that um, you were supposed to be always constantly looking for ways to cut your work down was a kind of uh, shame-based methodology, and then you had to then you have to ask like, what is it about this um, sort of work ethic of always reducing, reducing, reducing? Um, what is that really uh, perpetuating? You know, what is that that uh, that 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 encouragement to constantly, uh, you know, to constantly be stripping your work down? What is it that's being asked to, you know, to be left out? And oftentimes in the writing workshop, it essentially means, uh, you know, what it's essentially meant is stripping away um, uh, cultural context. Or anything that would uh, that would that locates the story uh, in a particular linguistic community or linguistic background or an ethnic community, all of that is the material that's supposed to be excised. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, please. I was wondering if you talked to us a bit about um, why it's important for students, um, maybe even students specifically at ASU, mm -hmm. to understand the ideas espoused. In um, well, look at the room we're in. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you know, so the, the, the most I think that the most basic um, the most basic point is exactly that. It's to start noticing the um, noticing who's in the room when you're having these conversations and how the conversations change depending on who's in the room and uh, you know, whose, whose perspectives are being represented and whose perspectives aren't. So, it's, you know, so the, the most basic thing, I think, is just the practice of noticing um, who's, uh, who's included in conversations and who's not. So that's, that's, that's one thing. But the other, you know, the, the reason why I chose this passage in particular is because it's about, um, it's about the way I learned how to workshop. Um, which was so much about it was you know it was it was just it was so much about this um, this idea that whatever you bring to the workshop has to be you know that there's there's always going to be something wrong with it and that the the point of the workshop is to tell you what's wrong with it 
Um, and that, you know, that is a, uh, that, that's something that I think is, um, it's, you know, it's so deeply, like, encoded in the sort of the whole practice of the workshop that what, what I would hope, and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not the only one, is that it draws, you know, it draws attention to the question of whether creative writing workshops as they're normatively practiced need to exist at all. And whether they, you know, whether um, what happens, the kind of teaching that goes on in creative writing programs needs to depend on the practice of the workshop, you know, per se. Yeah. David, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that I, you're, you're talking about like the necessity of workshop and, um, you know, I'm thinking of what you just read in the essay and just sort of like this critique of the traditional model that, uh, glorifies, you know, tightness and economy, mm. right? Uh, and I'm teaching an intro fiction workshop now, yeah. and uh, something I've tried the past couple semesters in this class, I, I introduced this interview with Ocean Belong where he talks about that language of the workshop mm -hmm. um, and relates it to like a capitalistic impulse, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm now interested in like that intersection, right? The, with what you're writing about. Yeah. Um, I'm curious uh, for you though, as a teacher of creative writing, yeah. and, Particularly with introductory writing classes, like what model do you um, like? What what model do you deploy in the classroom? I mm -hmm. feel like sometimes I like begin this conversation, and some of the students like feel like they haven't experienced that yet. Of course, I think that model extends beyond the mm -hmm. writing workshop, but I speak of it in that context, and they're like, "Has mm -hmm. it been familiar to me yet?" Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm rambling, but in an intro like setting, what is your sort of like? You can't take that away from mm -hmm. sitting where they're just beginning. So yeah, you know, Matt and I, when we were coming here, we went to the what is that place called? The the, the coffee, coffee place? Yeah, Dutch, Dutch Brothers. Dutch Brothers. So we went we went through the drive through at Dutch Brothers, <laughs> and yeah. the woman was very friendly and said like, Hey, where where are you going? Like, what are you up to? And we said we're going to a a, re a, a talk an event. What's it about? It's about writing. And she was like, I'm the world's worst writer. <laughs> And, and Matt said to her, no, you're not. You know, and she said, my mom wrote all my papers when I was in school. And he said, like, how do you know you're the world's worst writer? So like, so, so like one very basic thing is, um, and this is something I think about a lot, to like take away the feeling that, uh, to take away the feeling of like, I'm not good enough. And the feeling of, um, you know, I'll never be good enough to do this th this rarefied thing, um, and also this you know the sense that um, in creative you know that 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 the point of an introduction to creative writing class is is to um, you know take these students that are this sort of like you know take them in their you know their state of ignorance or whatever. And to just sort of like turn them, you know, they come out the other end and they're like little Mary Olivers or whatever, you know, like <laughs> this, you know, that, that in other words, like w the way that I, pro I, I approach intro to creative writing is offering them a whole wide range of different approaches to writing and essentially asking them to uh, get out of their comfort zone and to try to, to dare themselves to do things that are just radically different from anything they've, they've done before. And so the, you know, and that, this meant like essentially for me, giving up the sort of pedagogy that was based on a notion of literary excellence. You know, when it, for intro students especially, I think excellence is just not at all the point. Like I, I assigned my intro creative writing students the, the assignment of writing hip hop lyrics, not because I think they're gonna be great at it, but because it's such a good way to learn about rhythm and rhyme and structure, um, and because some of them might be great at it, and that you know I teach in a predominantly white institution, and it makes them so uncomfortable, and that's the point. The point is to um, allow them to uh, have the experience of like risking humiliation, which I think is you know I think that is that is so uh, that by itself is so important, and it has to do with shame. It ha you know it has to do with like the the feeling of um, I'm not supposed to be creative in these ways. Um, and it just, you know, so for me, it's like a lot of it just has to do with like moving over the idea of like, where do I want these students to get to? 
and instead just starting with them where they where they are. If that makes does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can I just maybe keep pushing on this idea a little bit? I I think the book does such a good job of sort of showing craft choices that preclude certain kinds of content to make it sort of safe to write mm -hmm. and engage race in, in different ways. And you know, your first novel obviously is doing the kind of work you're talking about and, and this is first novel your face and mine is, is about racial reassignment surgery and other things. Um, but I'm thinking about what are the what are the craft choices that would make it make that engagement uh, maybe not just possible but necessary. Mm -hmm. Like if, if these are mm -hmm. the Minimalism and the unpeopled landscape are ways of like avoiding race. Mm -hmm. What are the craft choices that make that space more fertile, or make like our engaging whiteness necessary to write in this way? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's something that I think about all the time because um, that that to me is a real conundrum. Right. Right. Is 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 how to make the how to how to come up with ways of teaching creative writing that encourage students to get over that boundary um, and I you know it's it's um, I mean you can you can do exercises that ask your students to uh, you can effectively assign your students to say right you know write about something that includes you know characters of different backgrounds and then how do you mark those characters how do you describe those characters uh, you can be very directive in that way um, I, I, I find that one approach is to um, one approach that works for me is to ask my students about their own work that they've previously produced. Um, ask them how they, uh, how did they come to uh, conceive of the characters? How did they see the characters in their stories? And do they imagine those characters being like them or not like them? Um, to ask them to you know, expand their own sort of frame of reference. And say if they're like describing a scene in a sorority, like to really think about like who's at that party in that sorority, like who's in the sorority, um, uh, and it, you know, and how can you bring out more of a sense of uh, a diversity of of you know people that you're describing in that way? Yes. Um, so I understand the, the thesis of the book and then the, your focus on the on the question of race and white shame. Um, but as you're talking, I'm wondering. Could extrapolate from that and what would be your perspective if you were to refocus it through gender or disability, sexuality, mm -hmm. to economic status, but I just, what was really going through my head was the question of gender. And could mm -hmm. we equate the, the problem of white shame mm -hmm. with male shame? Absolutely, you know, and, and in this case, in, the, in, the, in what I'm describing here with, with the interaction between Gordon Lish and Raymond Carver, it's very obvious that uh, Carver is experiencing intense feelings of emasculation mm -hmm. and intense feelings of something being uh, torn away from him that is, uh, you know, that is intensely, it's a, it's a sort of crisis of masculine control, you might say. Mm -hmm. So that to me, the two things, you can't separate the one from the other. And in some way, you know, and I'm, obviously I'm the, I'm the last person person to be saying this, this has been said for years, but the ethic of the creative writing workshop um, can be very um, masculinist in that way because it has to do so much with, um, you know, sort of splitting the, splitting the relationship between content and form and sort of making form this singular uh, achievement. So, you know, this is, this is a, um, you know that's a it's it's such a complicated subject, but I you know on on a very basic level, um, I would say that the question of just noticing who's in the room, you know, applies to all kinds of difference, obviously, and you know that's a you know that's a kind of an ethic that that you know can be you can look at it from lots of distance, different sources, um, but I often go back to the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas who wrote about the uh, the face of the other as the sort of ultimate existential challenge for the for a person's own subjectivity, and um, so one thing that Levinas is constantly asking is who is being excluded, who is not, who is being uh, othered, who is being left out of this conversation, who isn't being considered, um, and that can apply uh, again. That can apply to all kinds of difference. Yes. Yeah. 
two questions, I guess. Um, the first one I'm thinking about, it kind of relates to this question as well, um, about uh, white shame and also like, for gender or male shame. Mm -hmm. um, I was just read Playing in the Dark with Jenny Morrison. Yeah. Um, and so in that book, she talks about kind of the white male European coming to the United States, or not at that point coming to you know, the new world, mm -hmm. in order to escape what you're talking about, these like cultural historical ties, mm -hmm. to become both free and powerful in the yeah. sense that they would could create their own future in any way that they saw possible. And she kind of argues that that sort of freedom and power is only definable because there was the presence of, of other bodies. That they could say mm -hmm. that's what's not free and that's what's not powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious how that kind of feeds into what you're writing about now, because it seems like there's two different like, historical time periods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder how that transition, she talks about you know images of darkness leading towards images of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. it sounds like those images of darkness and otherness are kind of disappearing and just being hidden. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you see a relationship between Yeah, I mean, I, I write about this a little bit in the intro to, to White Flights, how much I, I feel like this book is sort of a continuation of the project of playing in the dark. Um, but Toni Morrison stops in the, she really stops around 1950, and this book picks up in 1970. So this book is about 1970 to the present. And, you know, I, I think the way that you've described it is a very good way of describing it, that um, what she calls the kind of the haunting of the Africanist presence, like the presence of the, the presence of the, of, of, of black people as this, you know, this image of the unfree, the image of the subjugated. Um, you know, after the civil rights movement, it's not that, um, that image becomes much more complicated. And so that's why I think that there's so much uh, just avoidance of the subject altogether. Um, and, so the, and, and so there's this, um, you know, what you see in a lot of cases is this kind of uh, ironic, um, two sides of the same coin, like this sort of searching for empty lands, landscapes that, you know, or, or sort of uh, kind of like prelapsarian landscapes, like, land, like uh, Jim Harrison's Legends of the Fall or something like that, like sort of empty, empty vistas, often which take place in the past, or a river runs through it is another example, something like that. And then at the, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have like super, super hyper claustrophobic uh, stories like Ann Tyler, Raymond Carver, Lydia Davis, people where they have characters operating in totally claustrophobic small spaces. And so, you know, like what's between like the claustrophobic small space and the like empty vista? Well, it's like everything else. It's like all that other, you know, all that other like uncomfortable stuff. Like, you know, I go to the grocery store and all of a sudden there's uh, people speaking languages I don't know in the grocery store. It's like, well, I don't want to write about that. So I'm going to write about this like totally enclosed space or this absolute, you know, sort of empty vista. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's a different kind of, it's like almost a more polite exclusion. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, you know, Morrison writes about people like Faulkner and Poe and Willa Cather, who are, who are all authors who are directly exposed to racist violence in their own lifetimes, you know, Poe, briefly owned an uh, enslaved person who he was, who was given to him. I think his aunt uh, gave this, uh, this enslaved servant to him. And then uh, he apparently sold this person not long thereafter. So he had direct experience of, uh, I mean, it, was, it not only surrounded him, but he was directly uh, implicated in it. And so, you know, he never, while well, he never wrote about it directly, you can't miss the presence of images of darkness and lightness in his work. I mean, as, as Morrison says, you have, to look ve you have to work very hard to ignore the presence of blackness in Poe's and the importance of blackness in, in Poe's work. So that is like, that's coming from like a, uh, you know, th that's coming from a context of like explicit violence and subjugation. And what you see after 1970 is that the explicit violence and subjugation is mostly out of the picture and so you get a kind of a much more like psychological posture of, of like of avoidance of like I'm just going to look at something else and pretend that this other thing isn't isn't happening. Yeah. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. narrator, um, mm -hmm. the, the construct of an omniscient narrator mm -hmm. um, asserts a kind of you know, like possible mm -hmm. reality or objectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, often connects these two a uh, very like white European male point of view. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I just been thinking recently about um, how a more subjective narrator versus an objective narrator might yeah it's a, I mean it's a great question so, so little contemporary fiction is written using omniscient narrators that I'm trying to sort of like think you know look for examples of that um, you know one of the ones that stand, that I write about here that that stands out to me is um, well I can I, I would actually maybe point to two examples uh, um, Jonathan Franzen in a book like The Corrections is, you know, he's using a variety of omniscient, you know, he's got lots of different characters, lots of different perspectives. And um, the really striking thing about that book to me is that um, it's this very, it's this omniscient or seemingly omniscient uh, narrator and this uh, very wide spanning view of American society in 1999 and there's no people of color anywhere in the story. You know, so there's, there's systematically, you know, once, you, once you're aware of that, you see how, um, how systematically they're excluded from every single scene. You know, restaurants, inner city Philadelphia, cruise ships, St. Louis, New York. It's like, how could you do that? You know, how, could, how can you write about all these spaces in 1999 and have it, you know, entirely focused on on white characters, it's really, it's, it's almost like a magic trick how he does it. Um, so there's that. And then the other example I would point to of a novel that uses another kind of, um, uh, yeah, you know, kind of sort of omniscience is, is Middlesex, Jeffrey Eugenides' novel. Middlesex in which he employs, uh, he employs omniscience to tell the story of this Greek family um, starting in Turkey in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and tracing them uh, as they move through sort of the steps of immigration and assimilation in America. Um, and the, the whole sort of history of the sort of transmogrification or whatever it is, transmigration or whatever of, of um, Greeks and other Southern Europeans into white American citizens. Like that's what the book is really, is about. And um, I think he uses, I would say he uses omniscience in that book very beautifully to illuminate stories and bits of the, the family story that wouldn't necessarily have survived uh, in the retelling if he didn't sort of like go back and like perversely investigate them, you know, using omniscient uh, techniques. I'm not sure if that's a helpful answer, but those are the, you know, those are the books that, that come to mind. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of um, when, when, uh, when artists are asked, I know I'm thinking specifically of like David Lynch, um, gave a response to when someone asked him like about the lack of um, white characters. He's like, well, my movies aren't about like race. And yeah. Like, so Sophia uh, right. Coppola gave a similar answer when the yeah. name of the movie came out a few summers ago. Um, yeah. In which it's like all white Southerners after the Civil War. Yes, life. that's right. And yeah, I never got to see that movie. Similar response of like, well, I wanted this to be about this and not about like race, and, and so I'm wondering yeah. what your response might be to their concern of, yeah. of having um, narratives that, that have characters that are mm -hmm. white, and mm -hmm. how, what their concern of like, well, if, if we do, if we did that, then we would delve into history of, of racism in America. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's it's interesting. You know, that question gets. Uh, I think that question has now probably been asked of every major white American director. You know, it was asked of the Coen Brothers. Um, it was, you know, because the question comes obviously the question comes up um, in a way now that it never would that it might not have in the say in the 1990s or in the 1980s. 
Um, and you know, it's it's it's. I think there's there's you could say there's sort of different different answers in every in every case. But what it you know what it demonstrates to me is it's not it's not just about the sort of like racialized exclusivity of the film business, although that plays a big part in it. It's not just about saying like, oh, we're not going to cast these people. You know, we're going to like limit the casting. It's about the vision of those directors, and the vision is uh, that you know, it's the vision of um, an exclusionary white um, context or white artistic vision. You know, in an era when the country became so much more diverse and racial, racially and culturally complex. So, you know, if you look at the Coen brothers, or you look at David Lynch or something like that, they have their individual artistic visions, and somehow they can only see fit to carry out those visions um, using white subjects. So to me, that, that means that their work is about whiteness. You know, that they're like, you can't separate the Coen brothers' use of, you know, motifs of the Western or, you know, all the different, you know, you can't separate that from, you know, a body of work that's about, um, that's about whiteness. Um, and, you know, that, that I think in, in some ways, like, that's the conversation that always gets avoided when it's, a, you know, when it's sort of like hashtag Oscar so white, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff about uh, casting, all that stuff is very, very important. But it's equally important to look at these major uh, directors or authors or whatever and simply say, well, let's look back at your career. You know, your movies, you've made all these movies, you've made all this stuff. Um, you know, what does it say about how uh, white culture has, um, you know, white culture, especially in film, has differentiated itself? And if you, you know, if you look at it in that way, like, you know, David Lynch's movies, and the, um, the kind of the images of like horror and abjection and monstrousness in his movies um, obviously takes on a racialized you know, aspect, just like with Poe. Like, you know, when the, you know, and it's like this sort of like empty Hollywood uh, setting, you know, like late at night, and then the um, woman like comes around them the restaurant and there's this like, you know, hideous monster. Well, who is the hideous monster? You know, like who is the white viewer afraid of in that scene? You know, it's, I mean, it, it just, it, in other words, it just like begs that kind of interpretation. More questions? Yeah, you had a second question. Yeah. Some of these ideas too. Yeah. Uh, trying to, like paying attention to who's in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's not like a person of like color sort of problem. That's white people's problem mm -hmm. to deal with that and have mm -hmm. that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder like what your thoughts on, or what your thoughts are on that. Like, is this just a conversation that needs to be happening in a white community, or is this a conversation that needs to be kind of happening across boundaries? Or uh, both, but it both. But I think it's it's um, it's very important to pay attention to the kinds of conversations that happen in all white spaces. And to, um, when possible, redirect those conversations towards some awareness of, you know, the, um, of the kind of the exclusivity and the kind of in-group values that are being mirrored in that space. Um, and that you know, and you know, and then hopefully turn that to some consideration of, of whiteness. Um, I think that's uh, that's 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 really essential um, because there's there's no way of uh, sort of understanding what Judith Butler calls the psychic life of power without um, thinking about the subjectivity of people who have power and. Um, hold on to it and aggregate it and protect it and maybe apologize for it and yet protect it at the same time. 
Um, you know, so you have to enter into the subjectivity of the people in power. On the other hand, um, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, if you're trying to model a kind of new community of understanding and interchange, then you have to take that kind of, you know, awareness of the subjectivity of white privilege and then put it in conversation with non-white people, you know, so, so both. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. There's much more to be said. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, that's a, it's a very, I mean, that, that subject, of course, it goes well beyond, like, literature or creative writing or anything. That's, like, a larger, much larger question. Like, turn it into, like, reflection on whiteness. I'm yeah. also kind of wondering, like, how does this conversation, like, in that sort of group of people, yeah. sort of like, a, like, just a white group, yeah. like, how does this conversation suggest something about our values that we're expressing? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, how we put that around? Yeah, totally, okay. totally, yeah. It's, I mean, um, with a, a lot of the people of color I, I, and writers of color that I interact with, like one of their major questions is what happens when we're not here? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like what happens when white people like are talking amongst themselves when we're not present? Um, and I think the, that awareness has to do with the fact that, well, the conversation really is different. And things really do get said that uh, people don't want to have repeated in public. Um, and so, you know, it's, so it's really important to um, uh, sort of to end that sort of group silence, you know, the sort of that, that, that like cordon of, well, we're not going to talk about what happened in this meeting, or we're not going to talk about what happened at the bar. You know, it's, you know, that, that is, it's the, Sometimes it's like the casual offhand conversations that are like the most damaging, but also the most illuminating. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of stuff that needs to be, you know, talked about and made public, which is really, you know, uncomfortable and embarrassing. Yeah. Um, kind of speaking on that, like feeling of uncomfortability, um, I feel like when you see like any big discussion about race, uh, especially as it comes in the context of writing, you tend to get stuff from like Mm -hmm. I guess how do you like start that without start that discussion, um, like and get past like the defensiveness that I mm -hmm. think a lot of people uh, jump to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, great question. How do you get past the defensiveness that people? How do you get get past the uh, the defensive part of the conversation? Um, I you know I I I often think that one way to approach that is to ask people to uh, maybe do a little bit of individual writing about a circumstance in which they felt uh, uncomfortable or a circumstance in which they felt judged or something that, that, and you can even do it in a way that distances the question from like questions of, you know, of race, you know. And then um, try to get people to uh, talk about their own vulnerabilities and make clear that you know whatever conversation you're having or whatever space that you're creating, that it's okay for people to say inappropriate things, and it's okay for them to talk about um, you know responses that are uh, that might make them look bad because you're cre you're creating a place where people can uh, you know talk about their racialized selves, and um, I think sometimes if you give people permission to feel uncomfortable then they become less uncomfortable. You know, if you say like, you know, we're all, nobody's perfect here, everybody has something to contribute and everybody's experience is valid, then you sort of give people permission to share more. But it also takes time, you know, it's, it takes, like, you know, you, it, it's, it's important to establish relationships and, you know, the problem with like sort of one-off diversity workshops often is that like, they just happen once. And then everyone's like, okay, done with that. You know, we're gonna walk on to the rest of our lives. So, you know, it's, I mean, the, the most important um, thing, I think, is to like get away from a reactive model. Like when I, was a, when I was a composition teacher, there was another, there was a much older composition teacher in my writing center who wrote this book about race in the composition classroom. She was a very well-intentioned person. Um, but the title of her book was When Race Breaks Out. And that, you know, 
the, the more I thought about it, like as years went on, it's like that is the problem. It's like, you know, it's like we're treating discussions about race as if there's some kind of like outbreak of, a ter of Ebola or something. It's like race is broken out. What are we going to do? Everybody run around. And, and so the problem with that is like from the <laughs> white uh, subjectivity or whatever, it's like treating race uh, in a purely reactive way, like something comes up and then we have to deal with it as opposed to saying like, well, I'm gonna build this into my syllabus from like day one to you know, week one to week 14. Like this is, you know, this, uh, we're not gonna assume that this is a conversation we have to have once. We're gonna accept that this is a conversation that we're gonna keep coming back to. You know, that like it's not just solved, you know, because it's never solved. Yeah. Do you have anything you know about, about your face in mind and um, I was just finishing reading or reading it today, and I like as I was going through. It's a book that denies, like, it does not allow itself to like inflict that erasure you're talking about mm. in white place, right? Mm. Um, and I, I would get this feeling sometimes. I really don't mean this as a criticism of the book. No, like, please, I get please. This feeling sometimes that like the interesting stuff about race was being distracted by like the rules of narrative. Like sometimes I was like, <laughs> I want to like sit with this idea yeah, and yeah. Like, think about it. Yeah. Um, and I, like you've sort of answered that question by like writing yeah. essays, right? Okay, now you can sit with that. Yeah, answer. yeah, so yeah it's so true. It's so true. So true. Is, like uh, you're a fiction writer. Yeah. Um, like project, forthcoming projects that yeah. you're thinking about or working on in the realm of fiction. Like, yeah. Um, you're talking about this sort of like, you know, the, the fiction's not going to solve anything just sort of like we're spending time with it, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, I, like the word incremental is in my head, but I hate that like idea. It's very frustrating to think of things that I'm just in um, Yeah. But like, what yeah. is, how are you thinking about your like forthcoming fiction projects and how they work alongside these essays, I guess is the question. Yeah, well, I you know, I always like to write fiction that has people, that involves people like having long conversations. And you know, having a lot of like a lot of a lot of dialogue, and you know, getting angry and arguing with one another, and um, you know, fiction that sort of goes from like a very high conceptual level to a very low conceptual level, and um, so sometimes uh, I get criticized for my books being too like sort of digressive in that way, but then you know, I sort of felt about your face and mine a little bit the way you felt, which is that. Um, you know, I kind of hated to, to like, you know, direct everything into like this sort of narrative tunnel, you know, because it has like a thriller like structure, like something has to happen at the end, like there's this big secret, what's going to happen? And, it, you know, it's like, um, so, you know, so I'm always, you know, as a fiction writer, like I'm always interested in um, finding ways to interrupt the narrative so people can keep talking. You know, and in the book, in the book I'm working on now, I'm working. I was just telling Matt, I turned in the first uh, half of my new novel to my editor and agent last week, and it's 400 pages. The first half is 400 pages, um, and there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of like talking. There's a lot of other things too. You know, there's a lot of other things too. But like, it's about Palestine. It's about climate change. It's about Tibetan Buddhism. It's like there's a lot to talk about. You know. Um, and you know, and it has you know, it has narrative structure, and things happen, and people die, and very very tragic things. But but it's like you know, it's like it's like enough about that. Let, let, let's get back to this conversation we were having about <laughs> metaphysics, because like um, like I would say like uh, uh, Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook is a great book that that sort of operates on that on that principle that I read uh, sort of recently. Because I was looking, I was looking for other long novels that sort of have this structure of like people just talking and talking and, and talking, and that you know that book you know there are events and it takes place over a very long historical continuum. But the most important thing is the is the conversations, um, and so you know when you when they when you bring up the word incremental. It's a really you know that's a that's a really interesting question because it gets to the point of like well what is the point of having all these conversations, and you know the the thing is that um, I feel like the 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 thing that fiction can do is um, really in in a sense it's there there are two things that from my perspective fiction can do, one is it can pre it can preserve 
a memory of what it was like to be alive at a certain moment in history. That's one very important thing. But the other thing that, that fiction can do is it can model, um, it can give us the opportunity to model um, stories that have ends. Like, think, you know, th in other words, thinking about um, a racial situation or thinking about you know, a situation of injustice that feels like it's never going to end in reality and sort of thinking about ways that it might end. You know, because that, you know, what, what fiction gives us is the ability to like create a situation and end the situation. And in life, we don't get to do that very often. You know, um, you know, we can't control the ends. We can't control our own end. We can't control the end of the Trump administration. We can't, you know, we can't, you know, we can't do that. But in fiction, you can control the end. So, you know, so that's like the narrative imperative. But then there's also the like the historical memory imperative. And so I'm also always interested in balancing those two things, um, which not you know not everybody uh, not a, not every writer or reader um, is is interested in that much uh, discourse. You know, some people just like sort of just going straight, but you know I'm I'm much more like more like this. Um, other, yeah, another question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether or not it's like possible to divorce uh, the literal light and darkness mm -hmm. from the sort of uh, symbolic associations that you've given to it. Um, I feel like light is a really light or lack of it is a very mm -hmm. common uh, literary mode of description. And, Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I, when you were asking the question, I had this flashback of this terrible experience I had once uh, singing karaoke in China, where uh, the song was Ebony and Ivory, you know, the, the, the <laughs> Paul McCartney song. And, it, you know, they come with these, they came with these videos, you know, they all had like these, these, these videos that, um, and so the video in this case was of a, an actor playing a piano and the, the actor had been painted with, with grease paint half black and white. Like, and I think it was actually a Chinese actor. He had been played, painted, you know, it was like the literalization of the black and white was like, it would have been taken to the furthest possible extreme of like, the person himself had like one black hand and one white hand. Um, it was just so horrible. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, just, it was this horrible um, uh, thing. This is, you know, that question comes up, came up a couple of times when I was writing this book, when I was writing about epiphanies, for one thing, because epiphanies are so much about light, and it's one of, and and they're one of these cases where you feel like, are we ever going to be able to get away from the association between like the dawn breaking and the like epiphany in the in the in the character in the story? So um, that was, you know, so that was one place where I really. You know, I mean, I think that this is one of the reasons that um, epiphanies have to be undone, or you know, you have to you have to um, be very careful about how you use that kind of imagery because it's so overdetermined, um, and it's overdetermined because of the sort of American belief in grace and redemption is this thing that just like comes down from on high. So that's, that's one way in which I, 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 I wrote about that very same frustration. And then the other time was when I was talking about interracial stories. Because interracial stories, and especially stories of the tragic mulatto, are often, uh, you know, are often coded in you know, black and white imagery, or imagery of like black bleeding into white or something like that. And it, it's so horrible most of the time, you know, like the dark shadows or like the shadow fell over her face or something like that. And um, again, it's like, you know, it's, it's important not only to recognize that those images can, are so, are these painful cliches, but that they're cliches because um, 
they're a way of relying on racialized thinking, that there always has to be this binary between black and white, and that we always have to be thinking in terms of this binary. And so part of what I argue in that, in that essay is that we need to be thinking much more about how the black-white binary in, you know, in American cultural life um, is, a, is a catechesis. It's a, it's, a, it's a binary that ne has never really existed. Um, and it's so boring. You know, when that, the when racial categorization is, is, just, is just boring. It's tedious because it's always so reductive in the way that black and white imagery is always so, uh, is always so reductive. You know, because it's like, you know, you're, you're either dealing with like pure black or pure white or some like, you know, mingling of the two. And, you, you know, you're left on this, you're left with a sense that there's only two possibilities, which is so, you know, which is so wrong and unhelpful. Um, and not, um, you know, and doesn't, doesn't, doesn't lend itself to interesting narratives. So that's, you know, my frustration is the same as your frustration. It's a, you know, that imagery is so... Uh, difficult to get away from. Maybe can we do maybe one, one, one more yeah. one more question? Anyone have a? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Can I? You didn't. You haven't asked the question yet. So uh, well, please go ahead. I guess I was thinking that like there's. I feel like in my sense there's two kinds of like Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and on the other side, it's like a stay in your lane, sort of. Like, you know, we gave you the benefit of the doubt. You know, we, uh, uh, people of color, mm -hmm. gave you guys a chance to try to do something. You were empathetic, empathy sucks. It, it's mm -hmm. a, an excuse for the status quo. Mm -hmm. Stop talking about us, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. you know, like, don't, like, do not engage in mm -hmm. any way. And mm -hmm. I feel like that pressure, like the pressure, the lishy pressure of, you know, write what you know and you know, get rid of everything else. But there's also the pressure of if I try to write something else, I'm going to get, I'm going to get beat up for it. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to me maybe more tangible in the classroom than the other thing because I feel like people don't, you know, most students are not coming in with like David was saying, like a background in uh, yeah. sense of literary values. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the cultural conversation has room for this other thing, which is more yeah um, on the alert. Yeah, so, so um, I, you know, I think what you're saying is, is really, really important. And what I always try to do is draw attention to the question of, I mean, it, it's a question of shame, again, what you're talking about, like the, the feeling of like, I don't want to do this because I'm going to be criticized for doing it wrong. I'm going to be criticized for being insensitive or inaccurate or, uh, you know, or just labeled as racist or something. So that, so, um, that to me too is a <clears throat> is largely um, a white fantasy of a kind of persecution that um, really needs to be unpacked, right? Like that the the feeling of like I'm not allowed to do this because uh, I'm going to get criticized or there's all this pressure or something. I think it's extremely important to unpack. Well, where do you see that pressure coming from? Who is the person you imagine doing the criticizing? Um, what is the worst case scenario? What can you imagine happening to you? Um, if, you if somebody called you a racist, you know, how would that make you feel? Like it's really important to like go into those, to, to ask those questions. Because um, you can get to a lot of interesting places by asking those questions. Um, that, you know, that, what we're talking about there is really like the, um, the whole notion of, or one part of the notion of white fragility, of this, you know, the sense of like this uh, white subjectivity that feels completely like comfortable and chill until somebody draws attention to its racialized existence. And then there's the sense of like fraud, like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? And so part of that comes from, as you say, it comes from like not having had a background, not having had these kinds of conversations. But it's just also, it's, you know, in a, in a broader sense, like it's just, it's illustrative of the way that uh, the psychology of power, which feels so sort of continuous and sustaining and 
and comfortable is actually very fragile. You know, and it's actually always filled with a kind of insecurity about what happens when my power is being taken away. So to me, you can take that conversation to very interesting places. But it's a, you know, it's a really difficult, <laughs> you know, it's a really, you know, it, 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 you have to, you know, I was, as I was saying earlier, like you have to, you know, with your students or in whatever uh, place this is happening, in a book group, in a reading or whatever, you have to um, ask people to take the risk of uh, feeling embarrassed, you know, and, fe and also take the risk of imagining, like, what is the worst thing that could happen? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, but it's, a, I mean, like, I feel like if you have, like, a failed conversation, then it's always really important to ask, like, why did this conversation fail? Mm -hmm. You know, like, if everyone's silent and nobody wants to talk, then let's talk about why nobody wants to talk. Now, yeah, you know, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah, yeah. That, like, my, like, how have, I guess, you responded in the past when somebody has criticized you for engaging in these topics? Like, a person, a non-white person has criticized you for trying to write about non yeah, so I, you know, so so uh, having written two books of the same quality like this is something that I've dealt with, and my my feeling is like when I go out into the world, having written this material, like my first priority is that any kind of response to the material is okay, as long as it doesn't, as long as there's no guns in the room, or you know, which you know, in some places is a you know that's a that's a question, um, you know, it, you know, any kind of response is okay. Um, if people are frustrated or angry or feel that I don't have the right to talk about it or whatever, it's totally fine. And uh, it's my job to, um, it's my job to absorb those responses and try to uh, engage on whatever level I can. But the fundamental truth is that like, you know, as I think all of us know, like these, um, these kinds of questions, they, you know, people bring all kinds of pain with them into the room when you're talking about race in an American context. And so you can't predict who's coming into the room and you can't predict how they're gonna respond to what's being presented. And so it's okay, you know? Like it's, you know, it's, it's, if, if uh, people criticize me, uh, that's totally fine. Like that, and, and uh, I, uh, I'll you know live with that criticism, and you know I welcome that criticism, and it's not going to um, you know like it's not going to destroy me, it's not going to uh, knock me off my pedestal. Like better for me not to have a pedestal, you know. Better for me, you know. The 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 important thing is the the conversation is much more important than. Uh, you know, than trying to like, you know, privilege my ideas and saying like, I'm the, this is the end of the conversation because it's not, it's just a continuing, you know, iteration of the conversation. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah.